What's up, everybody? Welcome to Theory Underground. I'm your host, David McCarricker. Today we are joined by a fellow traveler, Nance, who by at this point, if you've been around for the last couple of months, you're all pretty familiar with Nance. He's done a bunch of ex exegetical readings with me. And that's what we're here to do today, is exegetical readings. And if you're watching and you see that my lip sync is off, uh, everything's going to be kind of like delayed. I don't know what to do about that. I think it's, I think it's because of the laptop. I hate it. Just like, it's really distracting. Uh, but I hope it's not too distracting for everyone else. I hope, hope everyone else can deal with it. Nance, how you doing, man? Chilling. I had a plumbing issue at my house this morning. My toilet's leaking again. But uh, I'm going to ignore that and do this. <laughs> you know, there's some things that can be very productively procrastinated on, right? Like, like when you know you got to do something, so you do something else. Um, like the adulting's not actually about um, getting everything done when you're supposed to. It's 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 figuring out the art of doing the things you got to just in time. Um, so what is sex? I don't know. Apparently, it's belly buttons. So what we're about to be... <laughs> what we're going to be reading from here is the conclusion to What is Sex by Alenka Zupancic. If I just push control, CF, control find, and type in conclusion and click enter three times. Oh. Actually, well, type Adam's navel. It would have it would have been three times if I was starting from the beginning of the document, but because I did this earlier, it kind of started me after where I was trying to find. So yeah, Adam's navel. Here we go. It's on the screen. You can see it on the screen, right? Perfect. So um, we're gonna assume that you have not read chapters one through four. Um, we did do a lecture about the introduction, uh, we being Cadell Lass from Philosophy Portal and myself. Um, but this is the conclusion. The reason that I'm reading this, uh, that we're reading this, that we're doing an exegetical on it is because uh, in basically an hour, there's going to be a lecture session on this. So if you're watching this live and you want in on that, send me a direct message on Theory Underground and I'll get you the link so that after this call is over, you're able to join the live private lecture. It's private while it's live, then it will be reposted after the fact. But with all that said, we're going to dive into it. Um, I've got big questions about this text. I'm very confused in some ways. And even though I think I know what I'm supposed to say, I, I, I think I could probably answer questions in a on a quiz about this text like I could answer the questions and get correct results or whatever but I some of the concepts just they're not clicking for me in the way that sometimes a concept that's a really big one it takes a while to really sink in and so basically what Zupancic is proposing is that sexuality in the psychoanalytic tradition has never been about who you like or like masturbation or fucking or, or it's not these normal things that we kind of associate with sexuality. Instead, it's this much more expansive concept that is on like a sort of equal playing field with knowledge itself and that the production of knowledge um, is sort of simultaneous with drive. And really one of the things that makes this a little less confusing is if you just replace the word sexuality with the word drive every time you see it. If you just think about drive instead, it makes a lot more sense. But she's not going to give up on this word. She's going to refuse to cede it to the, the way that it tends to be used in America. And so we're all going to, you know, take a crack at trying to see the world 
her way. So with that said, do you want to read the first few paragraphs here, Nance? All right. From Adam's navel to Dream's navel. After this excursion into the possible philosophical and political implications of the psychoanalytic concept of sexuality, let us conclude with what seems to be its most daring implication, namely, that sexuality, as linked to the unconscious, is the point of a short circuit between ontology and epistemology. It is because of what is missing, fallen out, from the signifying structuring of being that the unconscious, as a form of knowledge, relates to the impossibility of being involved in and transmitted by sexuality. The theory that there exists a singular short circuit between ontological and epistemological dimensions is, of course, a very strong philosophical claim. Yet Freud himself suggested something of the sort in his account of the link between sexuality and knowledge. If sexuality is the drive of knowledge, it is not simply because we are curious about sex or because we sublimate the lack of sex with a passion for knowledge. For the lack at stake is not a possible lack of sex, but a lack at the very heart of sex, or more precisely, it concerns sex as the very structural incompleteness of being. Okay. One of Freud's major... Oh. Um, I just want to you know, point out that the idea of it being a short circuit between ontology and epistemology, uh, ontology being a theory of like what's real or making sense of various kinds of beings, as opposed to epistemology, which is like, how do we know? And so what is, so a short circuit, what does it mean to say that there is a short circuit between these two things? Do you have an idea of that? When I first, probably like maybe a month ago, read this, I thought it was articulating that that's that's an encounter with the real in a way um but to be quite honest that still is doesn't it doesn't click for me like i i still have more questions than answers yeah yeah same so uh but what about the the, the idea of a short circuit itself what is that I, I think of electrical stuff. I just, I don't know electrical stuff enough. To so really I thought of what is technically happening. I thought of like, uh, what's that movie? All, or I mean, all the, all the space movies where they're talking about black holes and wormholes and shit. And they take the paper. And they poke. I hope this isn't, but they poke a hole and they poke a hole and they fold it together. That that's, my mental image of what she's talking about. It's a way to um, get there that <clears throat> I I think that's a good image. I kind of have something similar. I just don't understand the literal. I don't understand what it means literally, right? But I'm going to read here from the beginning, the series forward, where Slavoj kind of explains it. He says, a short circuit occurs when there is a faulty connection in the network. Faulty, of course, from the standpoint of the network's smooth functioning. If not the shock of short circuiting, therefore, one of the best metaphors is not the, sh the shock of short, sh short circuiting, therefore, one of the best metaphors for a critical reading is not one of the most effective critical procedures to cross wires that do not usually touch. To take a major classic text author notion and read it in a short-circuiting way through the lens of a minor author text or conceptual apparatus. Minor should be understood here in Deleuze's sense, not of lesser quality, but marginalized, disavowed by the hegemonic ideology of or dealing with a lower, less dignified topic. If a minor reference is well chosen, such a procedure can lead to insights which completely shatter and undermine our common perceptions. Like in that sense, I think everything Theory Underground does is short-circuiting shit all the time. Like we're like, 
everyone's got like all their lanes that they like and that their wires and the smooth functioning of the system. Obviously, it's not so smooth functioning. Maybe it is for some people. And then we're over here just kind of like taking all these wires and we're like, <laughs> you know. Um, he says, this is what Marx, among others, did with philosophy and religion, short-circuiting philosophical speculation through the lens of political economy, that is to say, economic speculation. This is what Freud and Nietzsche did with morality, short-circuiting the highest ethical notions through the lens of the unconscious libidinal economy. What such a reading achieves is not a simple desublimation, a reduction of the higher intellectual content to its lower economic or libidinal cause. The aim of such an approach is, rather, the inherent decentering of the interpreted text, which brings to light its unthought, its disavowed presuppositions and consequences. This is exactly what she's proposing the idea of drive does to epistemology and ontology, two fields that tend to not cross over too much for philosophers in this day and age. And so, yeah, I think, oh no, shit. That is not what I wanted to. Hold on. Let's see. Adam's navel. Take it back to. So, yeah, we're back. And so, the other paragraph you just read is uh, the point is, is not that sex is making up for, uh, that, that, sorry, that the drive for knowledge comes from, you know, the repression or like failure to achieve like a sort of sexual satisfaction, right? Which is kind of like that idea. Well, you know, nerds, they're so smart, but they're like the unsexy people. So it's like they don't get laid, so they go and instead they, they learn a lot about things. Like that's kind of the, the Freudian idea would be like, well, of course what's going on there is they're just, you know, the, their repressed sexuality is being sublimated into a drive for knowledge. But she's, she's saying no, it's, it's not that at all. It's not, a sex, it's not a lack of sex, actually. It's the lack that is at the very heart of sex itself. And so this would actually then, I would, I would just add that that lack at the very heart of sex itself could also be the reason someone is super promiscuous. Like you take a man slut, he's just out there every night chasing women and it's just like, Dude, get a life. The, the reason he's, he has to go so hard is that there's a fundamental lack at the very heart of sex itself, right? So this comes down to the very structural incompleteness of being. All right. Um, sorry, I just wanted to make sure we stopped and kind of tarried on that part because I think without kind of elaborating on those two paragraphs, what follows is probably not going to be as clear, but let's keep going. One of Freud's major theories concerns sexuality as the realm within which the quest, desire for knowledge, takes off. This Freudian genealogy of the passion for knowledge is in itself complex and intriguing, but its basic outline would be as follows. There is no original drive for knowledge. It surfaces at points of existential difficulty, for example, when children feel threatened by the fact or the possibility of acquiring a sibling. Sexuality very soon becomes an obvious player in all questions about being there of oneself and of others. It enters the stage with the question of being, how do we come to be? And it enters as a negativity, as the unsatisfactory character of all possible positive answers. For while it is obviously involved in the becoming of being, sexuality nevertheless Nevertheless, provides no point of attachment, no anchoring point in the explication of being as being. Moreover, for the inquisitive infant, sexuality is often bound up with stories and myths, embarrassment and avoidance, sometimes even with disgust and punishment. See, when, when she says that, it makes me think, because when I think of drive, I think of something that's much more expansive than sexuality. But when I think of, and we're supposed to think of drive and sexuality basically synonymously here, but then she keeps coming back to kind of like the sort of myths, embarrassment, and avoidance that come with what we would probably think of as more standard sexuality in childhood, right? 
like just the awkward, embarrassing shit. So it's like, but would this, if this concept of sexuality, this uh, is one that unifies, unifies in a sort of contradictory way. Uh, sex and knowledge, um, then are, are, is this idea of stories, myths, embarrassment, avoidance, not just what we would tend to think of as sex. It's also um, related to language itself, reason itself, communication and understanding itself, right? Uh I guess it, it's probably embarrassing to tr keep trying to say a word and nobody understands it, right, as a child, right? No one understands you. You can't pronounce something correctly so people laugh at you. So, so it's like we probably – so, yeah, it, I guess just getting away from penises and vulvas and thinking about, like, there's, there's more going on here, you know. This, this goes down into basically everything about subjectivization at an early age. Before we sigh that, well, this is all again all about our petty little family so stories and structures, she's, she's getting a dig in on, on the people who are so over structuralism, right? She's like, this, this is her, her peers in academia who roll their eyes when they hear her and Slavoj Žižek talking. Before we sigh that, oh, well, this is again all about our petty little family stories and structures, it is crucial to acknowledge that the true question only begins at this point. It is not that these family structures can explain the real of sexuality, but rather that something in the latter can explain or point to the gap that drives these structures. Right. So, like these little, like the the Oedipus complex, or some you know, think various structures that we use to try to make sense of people and of families and of development. Th those are downstream from the gap that drives the development of such theories. The embarrassment at covering up of sexuality by adults should not be taken as self-explanatory, that is, as explained by the traditional cultural ban on sexuality, right? Oh, people just hate sex, that's why this is this way. But rather the other way around. As I keep insisting, the cause of embarrassment in sexuality is not simply something which is there on display in it, but on the contrary, something that is not there and is or would be of the order of knowledge. The fairy tales with which we explain sexuality to children are there not so much in order to mask and distort the realistic explanation, but to mask the fact that there is no realistic explanation and that even the most exhaustive scientific explanation lacks the signifier that would account for the sexual as sexual. I think I want to point out here what, 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 are, what are a couple examples that come to mind, Nance, of fairy tales with which we explain sexuality to children? I mean, it's kind of hard to think of one because I think it's it's so it's almost like endemic to all our fairy tales, like that family structure. Um, so to kind of come up with a good example is actually kind of difficult. Um, the, the thing I have here, so I mean, obviously like storks, right? Like that's the most, it, hmm. when we think of sex, we think of like, oh, there's a story of storks. Like think of the, the cartoon Dumbo with like the storks flying in at the beginning. Um, you know, there's various ways that we have like myths about like how people are born. Uh, there's the fact that the religious terminology for making babies is just to lay with somebody, right? Which definitely plants in the minds of all religious kids growing up that, oh, you make babies by going and laying in bed with somebody. Better not lay in bed with someone unless I want babies with them, you know? Um, but that's not all I'm trying, I'm trying to read this, like thinking about knowledge 
and drive, not just sexuality, because these are all kind of the same sort of bundle for her. There's like short circuits between these things. So I would think then that also we make up fairy tales to explain sexuality to children, not just to mask the realistic explanation, but specifically there is no realistic explanation. So if we think about drive, we think about uh, com uh, repetition compulsion and the fact that you do things and you're not sure why you're doing them. And so it's like we tell ourselves fairy tales about why we do things that are the product of drive. And we obviously tell our children fairy tales about why we do things as well. We keep snapping at them for X, Y, and Z reasons. But are those reasons really the reasons? Those might be fairy tales too in this sense, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think it's all it's all a, one big fairy tale. Um, like, uh, yeah, why do you go to work and bend over backwards and and uh, prostrate yourself before the boss. Um, the fairy tale explanation is so I can be, you know, seen and not passed over for the promotion, and I can be, you know, move up in the American dream. Yay! Um, but that's a fairy tale itself. Like, no, we do that because we, um, I don't want to say are afraid to, to do otherwise, but that, to do otherwise is, is not done. Yeah. That's good. What is at stake with this lack is thus not a missing piece of knowledge about the sexual as a full entity in itself. What is that? Because, yeah, there's no full entity that can be thought of as sex, right? What is at stake is that drive, in parentheses, sexuality and knowledge, are structured around a fundamental negativity which unites them at the point of the unconscious. When I was listening to this, the robot reader didn't make a distinction here. It didn't tell me that was in parentheses. So it read it like this. It said, what is at stake is that drive, sexuality, and knowledge are structured around a fundamental negativity which unites them at the point of the unconscious. And I stopped. I stopped and I was like, I had to stop and I was like, did she just say drive, sexuality, and knowledge? Because that fucks everything up if those three things are separate for her. So then I went back and I was like, oh no, in parentheses she says, she says drive. And then what she actually says is sexuality and knowledge. So she's saying sexuality and knowledge are drive. Right? Okay. What is at stake is that drive, sexuality, and knowledge are structured around a fundamental negativity which unites them at the point of the unconscious. The unconscious is the concept of an inherent link between sexuality and knowledge in their very negativity. The conclusion we can draw from all this thus would thus be the following. Whenever it comes to social, cultural, or religious covering up of sexuality, we can be sure that it never covers up simply what is there. For example, the sexual organs, but also, and perhaps primarily, something which is not there. It also covers up some fundamental ambiguity, which is, from the outset, of a metaphysical order, meaning having to do with fundamental reality, whatever that is. I always clarify that because people think that means like crystals and UFOs or some shit, thanks to the book sections in, in America. In other words, the more we try to think the sexual as sexual, that is, the more we try to think it only for what it is, without censorship and embellishments, the quicker we find ourselves in the, in the element of pure and profound metaphysics. This is why there is no neutral way to speak about sex. Even if we pretend not to hide anything and speak only of facts, something else seems to get added or to disappear. So, you know, like this would go for uh, extreme sex positive kinds of media, right? Something's always missing. A vivid and direct illustration of this can be found in the form of a problem that early artists faced when they painted Adam and Eve, a problem that relates these questions to our earlier discussion of realism. The problem the artists faced was the following. Should they portray the first couple with or without navels? Adam was molded from spit and clay, Eve from Adam's rib. They were not born of women, 
So how could they have navels, belly buttons? Yet they look strange without them. They were the first humans, and they should look like other humans. But if a human, but but if as humans they were created in God's image, God also has to have a navel, which generates new conceptual difficulties. This illustrates the dilemma that Goss or Gasse was facing when he was trying to reconcile the geological age of fossils with God's creation according to Genesis. His answer was that when God created Adam, he also created the navel. That is to say, his ancestry. So the, right, which is, I mean, th that's plausible, you know, because God could say, I'm going to create a whole universe right now, and I'm going to fast forward to the point that I'm interested in, which is the, the, the consciousness of a human. So I'm going to set in motion, you know, however many billion years of shit necessary to get to the point that I want to be at so that I can actually have a relationship with something or someone like, you know, that's, it's actually kind of an easy theological sidestep for a lot of Richard Dawkins esque atheism. Just given the devil their due here. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it, those are pretty easy to sidestep issues. So the problem the artists faced was quite real and they often dodged the question by extending fig leaves so that they covered not only the sexual organs, but the lower belly as well. They're just like, let's just, Let's just not deal with this problem at all. Let's just extend the fig leaf so we don't have to get boiled down in this debate. Is not this extending of the fig leaves to hide more than just sexual organs a perfect illustration of the argument I am making here? Namely, that by covering up the sexual, one always also, and perhaps primarily, covers up something else, something that is not there, and which tends to raise some deeply metaphysical issues and ambiguities. See, like, that's... I would like examples of that. You know what I mean? Like I, I want to, I, I just want some concrete examples of, namely that by covering up the sexual, one all one all, always also, and perhaps primarily covers up something else. So, so it's like, okay, we've got the example of the belly button, but that sh this is a metaphor for something a lot more concrete and there should be a lot of examples of it in our lives, but I'm just at a loss here. And it should come as no surprise that it is precisely this additional point that is the principal locus of myths and fantasies about procreation and about our origins. Different theological theories surrounding the issue of Adam's navel, for example, the pre umbilis mid umbilis and post umbilis theories constitute fascinating reading. I wonder if when she says that, when she says fascinating reading, like, is she just being, is there, is there a hint of sarcasm here? Is it kind of like, like a Pepe, like, <laughs> you know, like. I think it is fascinating. Like that's, it, it demonstrates um, the sometimes beautiful things that we do to, to fool ourselves into getting on with, you know, the, the shit that's otherwise miserable. Like that's, that's why we cover it because it is a void and it is scary and terrifying. So we create fantasies and it, it's, it's fascinating. Like. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. I, I, I suspect that she agrees with you hundred percent here. The extended fig leaf covers not simply the sexual, but the navel as the elected figure of the scar left by the lapse of being the lapse of being involved in sexuation, the sexual and sexual reproduction. If sexuality seems to exist only on the ontic level and to have no proper ontological dignity, the reason is not that it corresponds to nothing on the ontological level, but rather that it corresponds to a gap inside this ontological level. Um, I'll reread that in a second. I just want to help with the distinction between ontic and ontological. Basically, the ontic has to do with empirically obs observable, repeatable, instantiations of being whereas the ontological level has to do with trying to like generalize structures about being itself okay from from those empirical ontic manifestations we're able to deduce ontological structures and stuff but the point is is you can't take the ontic for fundamental reality right these are these are manifestations of things and it's never the complete story it's always just 
perspectives and aspects of being, you know. If sexuality seems to exist only on the ontic level and to have no proper ontological dignity, the reason is not that it corresponds to nothing on the ontological level, but rather that it corresponds to a gap inside this ontological level. Right. And speaking of navels, it is, of course, no coincidence that we find in Freud in the interpretation of dreams, the famous as well as curious expression Der Nebel des Trumps, the dream's navel, related not to what we can know, but to the whole in the very net of knowledge that can be laid out in the analytic interpretation. Do you want to read the quote here and then keep going? There is often a passage in even the most thoroughly interpreted dream which has to be left obscure. This is because we become aware during the work of interpretation that at the point that at that point there is a tangle of dream thoughts which cannot be unraveled and which, moreover, adds nothing to our knowledge of the content of the dream. This is the dream's navel, the spot where it reaches down into the unknown. I would suggest that we should read the term unknown, not as referring to something unknown to us, but in a stronger sense of the gap in knowledge coinciding with the gap in being. We do not know because there is nothing to know. Yet this nothing is inherent to being and constitutes its irreducible crack. It registers as a peculiar negative epistemological score. It registers as a peculiar form of knowledge, the unconscious. And that's it. We did it. Um, thanks, Mihao, for sending me that message. Uh, Michael and Poland sent me a message saying I'd, cro I'd crop that shit too much uh, on the OBS side. So I'm sorry if it was a little cut off for everybody. I think that there was probably like the first two to three letters of each word on the left-hand side that were cropped out. Uh, it's I think it's because like I moving around. I think I think some of the pages are different sizes than some of the other pages in this PDF or some shit. I don't, I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but... <clears throat> so basically, we've got uh, we've got a few minutes here to to talk about this, and then to you know check in on the chat and see if anybody said anything, and you know what's going on. So I guess I'll just ask you uh, your thoughts on all this, and then we'll just kind of talk about it. I I like. Um... I think I'm more comfortable with the idea of of knowledge than sex. Um, thinking about sex, I guess thinking about sex and sexuation seriously is still new to me. Um, but the the gap in knowledge and and the nothing, um, I can relate that to knowledge. Um, and relating it to sex is i guess starting to make sense in a, in a way um or or it's starting to become more interesting to me like sex and sexuation were just kind of uninteresting to me before this what's the um, difference between sex and sexuation as far as you i mean obviously i'm not asking for a definitive definition but just like i'm trying to make sense of it you know so I take sexuation to mean um, like the male and the female. Yeah. Okay. In Lacan. Yeah. And then sex is this um, coming into contact with, with that gap um, through, I guess, through actual physical intercourse, but also... Um, that is that's there in everything we do um and i guess only through sex maybe not only through sex but in sex we we see how we see the gap the gap exposes itself it gapes <laughs> so yeah sexuation in the lacanian sense is not strictly the matter of XX and XY chromosomes, is it? It would be 
the it would be in your formative years coming into a subjective relation to having it or not having it to performing yes. it to not performing it right and uh it's it's uh it's a fundamental psychological predisposition towards certain uh structural symbolic dynamics right and i think we can always do the oh you know xy chromosome people are at a population level always going to tend in a certain direction towards how they take on a certain relationship to having it or not having it and then that brings in the whole arguments over how much of that is socially constructed, how much of that is historically contingent, how much of that is culturally relative, et cetera, et cetera. And those are all productive things to think about. But the main thing is just the, the idea of sexuation itself is fundamental. And I agree with you here when you're saying that this was not so interesting to you um, before. You know, I think especially years ago, it was a lot less interesting. Like it was just kind of like, there, you know, there's a, obviously a point in my life when it was just like, well, boys are boys, girls are girls, right? Like, and then later on, it's like, oh, you are what you identify as, and it, it's a lot more complicated than the binary. And then eventually, I'm like, okay, well, people seem to come completely want to eradicate and and erase embodiment itself, and 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 act like. Like that can just be changed however we want when it, in, it, oh, you know, yeah, you could definitely appear more like a woman, but like, you're not going to have, at this point, you're not going to have a womb and uh, you, and you won't have gone through a female puberty, which means that uh, the p female puberty puts you into a fundamental relation to nature that you're not put into as a dude. Like it's a, it's a weird situation, you know, and uh, I'm... You know, I've thankfully I've got women who are very uh, I don't I don't I don't want to say blunt I want to say educational to me about like what it's like to to be embodied when it's like with a, as a guy you can just kind of go you just go and you can kind of forget that you're tethered to nature. A woman's reminded every month. It's like oh you want to do these things and you want oh but you oh reminder pew, 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 reminder and then the other reminder that women get. Uh, on account of embodiment is the one about like, oh, it's not just that you can be, you know, brutally like, you know, beat up on the way somewhere. It's also that depending on what occurs, you can also get pregnant, right? And that's different. That's a different kind of existential possibility on your horizon that brings in a kind of consciousness. Well, I, I would say, tends to bring in a certain kind of consciousness to responsibility itself. It's on a different level than like what will fuck boys run around just with fewer responsibilities and a sense of reality experience. Right. And so like if, if guys sexed guys are, you know, tend to act in certain ways a little bit more than, um, than women, it's probably pretty, pretty fundamentally related to that kind of shit. Right. Um, that stuff is, part and parcel to sexuation, though I don't think Lacan really gets into any of it. And I think, I think Merleau-Ponty probably would have gotten into it if the discourse was where it was at today at their time and Lacan was doing what he was doing. Merleau-Ponty would have probably wrote a whole book about this shit because he was all about the fundamental ways that our embodiment affect perception and interpretation and everything like that. So... Instead, that's just like that work is on us, you know. Hmm. Um, but we won't even be able to do it until, until we've read and reread a lot of this stuff, you know. So for right now, I guess I just, I, I guess I would just say, yeah, this has definitely kind of turned on a big light bulb and a question mark for me as to how this stuff matters. We've got one side. I think this, yeah, I think, I think this is a, 
just a very effective way to kind of combat social constructionism. Um, I, I think this this is a way to see how that fails, um, and in a productive way, rather than kind of relying on old myths and and you know just being a backwards looking person. Like this is a way to demonstrate, like yeah, um, there's a lot of good stuff there. But you can't go whole hog on that because, because like then you are leaving embodiedness behind, and and it's it's not just the social dynamics; like it, it's real in your subjective from your subjective position. That embodiment changes um, the things you're even able to experience and, and think and feel. Um, and you can't just throw that out with the bathwater. And this shows us why without also being wrong. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the idea that this is going to be a sort of third way to naive progressivism and reactionary gender theory, gen, or we could say gender theory left and right, is fascinating. And I think I think it scares people and I think people don't want to they don't want to touch it because they really want to take a side between that binary between it's it's like there's there are there are media outlets and personalities influencers and very excited fandoms on the left and the right between these two simplistic options and there's no money in thinking about it critically. And you can potentially get harassed or, you know, uh, like beat the shit out of Or much worse. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, you know, it's something we've even had to talk about. Is, is doing this going to make it so that when we're on tour, we get jumped somewhere or something like that? And it's like, well, we hope not. But, you know, I, it's not going to stop us because... It's just like if you just play in the safe lane or you just want to play in the safe lane, there's institutions for you already. Like the whole, the whole of the United States institutional matrix, like the, the entirety of it is uh, risk averse and uh, you know, trying to cover its ass from litigation. And so it's like, you know, it's just it's not a place where there's thinking, you know. So Alenka, based, badass. Um, I guess for now, it, yeah, it's really short. This book is short. Um, the course begins Saturday, uh, sorry, Sunday uh, the 7th, right? So Sunday, May 7th, and then it's going to be two days in May, two days in June. That's the in-depth lecture sessions. Uh, we obviously have the the three reasons to read Alenka Zupancic, What is Sex, lecture currently available on my channel, as well as the introduction lecture. Uh, those are just freely available. Um, and then this one will be freely available. And so people, uh, the, uh, I say this one being the one that's coming up here in a half hour. And so if you're watching this and you want in on that, just send me a direct message on theoryunderground.com theory-underground.com and uh, I'll get you the link so you can join for that Zoom call. Um, and then uh, we will be making a very special announcement, which I've kind of already uh, announced. I didn't realize that we were kind of putting it off to make the special announcement. But yeah, you will be able to meet Elenka Zupancic in this class. She will be visiting the class and uh, getting to, you know, so students will get to introduce themselves and talk, you know, raise questions and propose their projects and everything like that and actually get her feedback, which is, I, this was not originally part of the plan, but um, I was already in dialogue with her about something else and I kind of threw the opportunity out there and she was, she was like, hell yeah. So um, we're really excited about that. That's going to be really cool. Um, so with that, do you uh, want to add anything before we close this thing out? No. That's cool. All right, I'm going to roll the PSA. Peace, everybody.
And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the US, where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground.com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in Time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. 
In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye.